Good morning all. I am Anjusha Marar, Cyber Security Associate, ACPL System Private Limited, and I am a Cyber Shiksha alumni in the past out year 2019. And Cyber Shiksha is a skill initiative program by DSCI and Microsoft. So I am delighted to welcome to you all for this session AI SS 2023. So the session we have, responsibility of security and privacy provision, seeing beyond the immediate professional needs. And I'm pleasure to invite all the panelists on the dais. We have Mr. Himanshu Sharma, OT, Cyber Security, CISO, Dalmia Bharat Group. Welcome, sir. Then we have... Mr. Pradeepto Chakravarti, Director, South Asia Comptia. Welcome, sir. <laughs> Mr. Clayton Johns, Managing Director, Asia Pacific ISC Square. Welcome, sir. <laughs> then we have Ms. Priyamvada, Head Cybersecurity Practice, Bosch Global Software Technology. Welcome, ma'am. Then we have Mr. Amir Pandey, FRL IT Security and Compliance, Nestle. <laughs> so I'm thankful to DSEI for giving this opportunity to learn and look for, for the session today and requesting the moderator, Mr. Ms. Premvata, ma'am, to hand over the session. Okay, morning to all of you. Can you hear me, all of you? Okay. Um, I will moderate the session and also will be a panelist as required <laughs> on this session. Okay, so the background for this um, <clears throat> discussion, which is a very broad discussion, uh, cyber, I mean, looking at needs beyond professional, uh, current professional requirements. Um, essentially, we come with the idea that today technology is rapidly ev evolving. Every product and service that we know is now connected to the internet and has a lot of data that it collects and also processes. Then we have new advances in technology. We are on the cloud. We are on the cloud. We have we are, we are, we are moving large scale towards AI and ML. Then we have connected industry, industry 4.0, Internet of Things, heterogeneous devices connecting to the internet. So this this creates <clears throat> a digital footprint and the kind of scale and complexity that it brings, brings new cyber security challenges. So that's one corner we uh, in our discussion. The second corner is the <clears throat> India's advance in building the digital public infrastructure. Most of us know it through Aadhaar and the UPI interface that we use. And this is definitely a leapfrog in technology building. It's a public infrastructure, it's open source, and it has made a big advancement in tech, tech inclusivity. Okay. It's bringing technology to people. But at the same time, we do hear concerns about privacy and there are occasional frauds that we hear in the news. So essentially, we see that um, this advancement in digitalization, it's, uh, we are not really catching up with digital literacy, to soak in this advancement in digital technologies that we have as on today. So we start our discussion with this uh, point. So what are the challenges there? How could that be addressed? And then we look at, come up to the governance frameworks that could perhaps address these challenges. So the very first um, question on to the panel is that, <clears throat> what is this digital divide? What is this digital literacy gap? And how do you think we can bridge this. Yeah. Okay, I'll go first. Priyamada, first of all, good morning to everybody. Uh, so you called out this terminology, digital divide, and it's it's for real. Uh, on one hand, we are talking about all the uh, 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 all the great jargons, terminologies, uh, the digital public uh, infrastructure, the three uh, uh, you know pillars. 
the identity the payment system and the you know security and privacy very soon we'll be talking about digital rupee uh, digital currency yeah. uh, but uh, this morning when we were talking and we were uh, uh, you know sharing notes uh, we got to know pradeep to's uh, father f- uh, fell prey uh, to a to a fraud and uh, one of our team members one of my team members uh, neighbor uh, uh, senior citizens uh, both uh, you know lady and gentleman above 70 years uh they also fell prey to a fraud uh somebody in the name of cashback uh they requested them to install any desk on their phone and it was a complete uh, uh, took over of the mobile phone so so i think this digital device divide is for real uh the tagline for the uh, for the panel uh, discussion also talks about going beyond immediate professional needs uh one example that i would personally want to uh, bring out to uh, uh, to the dais and to the audience uh when the covid happened uh, uh the schools went on digital the teachers who uh, uh, you know most part of the country were not well aware with the phones whatsapps and so on and so forth and so there was a bigger need uh, a broader need for the teaching staff the administrative staff the parents uh to get well versed and not fall prey uh, via the uh, means of technology because that point in time the the fraudulent activities uh, there was a huge uptick in that uh so we at dalmia we have a uh, we have a, a, a you know education society by the name of dalmia vidya mandir uh, i ran a session for more than 120 uh, school teachers uh, non teaching staff on the basics and uh, to our surprise Uh, many of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, many of the teachers many of the senior uh, uh, teachers they did not uh, know the basics so i think that digital device divide is for real and uh, uh, aside from uh, uh, you know building that smart and cyber secure digital infrastructure at the country level i think that awareness level at the grassroots is also something that we as uh, uh, you know part of this ecosystem uh, should start focusing on and rather you know start leveraging our knowledge uh, our understandings at the corporate side uh, replicate at the at the end user side uh, pradeep to do you want to sure yeah. uh, thank you very much ma'am and th- uh, good morning to everyone here uh, because i was on the receiving end and it was very ironical because i talk about cyber hygiene and uh, my dad is 90 and uh, and it was just one evening before diwali and uh, it was nearly 11 lakhs you know it's uh, it's a big sum of money what i learned out of that whole uh, process was two things one is that uh, what happens when such incident occur uh, who to be blamed see technically uh, he installed a software in his phone right so that's one so it was his fault let's face it on the other hand uh his using an i mobile app or uh, internet banking is necessary because of uh you know you know the the convenience of it so who takes the onus and that's where i think the entire conversation or narrative should remain in terms of uh, so if you look at a consumer if you look at service provider if you look at device and software providers i think there has to be uh a uh, synchronization among all of that towards uh, you know figuring out a the onus and two how to uh, resolve it and awareness becomes a big part of it uh, and like you know then we were talking about the digital divide where uh, you know uh, our household helps or uh, anybody that you log i mean they are all uh, using smart phones and uh, you know uh, digital means of uh you know uh, doing those services or providing financial uh, support to their families so uh, i think uh, we also talked about a very uh, uh, successful initiative vimanshu pointed out before uh, while we were uh, in the back room is that uh, the successful awareness campaigns of pulse, pulse polio that we talked about uh, right now rbi is doing a lot of those awareness but i think it has to be a little bit more on the ground level uh, ironically what happens is that when those when mr bachchan comes on the television you generally put him on mute uh, whereas uh, if you look at the pulse polio uh, campaign it was door to door so i am not saying that you go down to that level but the aspiration should be that senior citizens children and people who are below uh, a certain level of digital literacy 
uh, should be made aware with tools and experiences and examples. Uh, yeah, yes. it needs to be fast and the scale should be really of that order. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. So that leads to the, uh, to the concept that you had shared about looking at security and privacy as a public good. Yeah. Because uh, once it becomes a public good, it becomes a responsibility to ensure that you elevate or provide a certain baseline, right? I mean, um, both in terms of awareness, also looking at product security. I mean, how secure are the devices that you use? I mean, you have ratings for, say, like energy efficiency. Do you have ratings for liquid security on your, say, a Wi-Fi router that you use at home? Um, like we see, you know, we engage um, like with numerous agencies uh, say across the world and we see that there is also that discussion about um, where do you shift the responsibility. Right now it is buyer beware, right? I mean, uh, manufacturers are now also beginning to take responsibility. It's like the seatbelt, you know, in the car. I mean, uh, security will become embedded. Uh, will be a requirement to be embedded uh, like in devices. And that would lead to the concept that you had shared earlier uh, about it being both, uh, like I would say, private, uh, no, I would say public good. Yeah. Yes. I think, uh, good morning, my name is Amir. I think one important factor which is there is that the digital journey has started. We're in a phase of transition right now. Like I'm a 90, 90 kid, if I tell my son today that do you understand what is a cassette recorder, he would not understand it. But I know something like that was existing. Now with respect to that, the security journey has also started. If we see like 10 years before in a company, you would see people who were not representing in board meetings or the senior management meetings with respect to security. Today we have found that place. Most of the organization has found that place. Mm -hmm. The primary most important thing with this is the awareness of management. Now, like we keep on hearing that management does not get involved. Management has other business things to do. But I think onus is more on people like us who run this security. Uh, I can give one example, which is, you know, I, I found that very interesting. So there is an annual uh, training, which is mandatory for security to be done. But I didn't find much of an traction on it. And then what I did is that I created an, uh, some deck and in which I emphasized more on before something else on individual as me. Individual as me, how I am on cyber risk. And when I started, you know, populating those slides, the one thing which was very interesting was a WhatsApp hi from a beautiful girl and an SBI saying that you need to change your OTP immediately. As soon as I showed that slide, everybody's focus was on that particular slide. I think that's the one primary thing which is there. The content which we are showing to our management to get them involved in the discussions is very important. The storytelling to the management that why cybersecurity is important, which I believe most of the management understands now because every second day we have a news of that. And uh, they acknowledge it, but it's a continuous process. If we want to bridge that gap, we have to continuously keep doing something or the other thing on that, not wait for the month of October to do an awareness session. Yeah, so that was another set of stakeholders, the private enterprise. So at large, most of the risks that are associated with um, our digital private uh, public infrastructure are in the form of social engineering. So there's a whole lot of awareness that needs to go out to the public as to how you could be duped with social engineering. Yeah, and that should be done at a scale that we, that we already discussed. Okay, now then we come to the second set of say, stakeholders when we talk about um, <clears throat> going beyond professional needs. We know that there are nearly 5 million uh, cybersecurity professionals in the world, but there is a huge <coughs> skill shortage which is growing, which is widening. We have a I think current skills shortage of around 3 million, but this is going to increase. And in India, the numbers show a much more uh, bleaker story. So um, if we have tasks to do, who is doing it? And who is doing it competently and in a capable manner? So how do we bring this up? So Pradeepto, maybe you could start our discussion on 
how do we get this competence in? So uh, my experience has been uh, pretty much working with uh, uh, you know a lot of youngsters. So I, I speak to uh, a lot of colleges, universities uh, to uh, uh, you know entice students towards a career in cybersecurity. Like so, uh, so what I realize is that there is a there is a gap. There was a time when there was a lot of software development. Uh, you know, jobs which were in the offing. So that legacy is still continuing in the mind of students. So when I go and talk to uh, students, and the first question that I open up is that, what do you understand uh, by career in cybersecurity? Now, all of them feel that, yes, there is a career. But eight out of 10 raise their hand and say that all they equate with uh, cybersecurity is the word hacking. And I have to then go in and tell a lot about uh, you know, that there is a huge bunch of job roles that are available uh, and people are ready to, uh, you know, take this. So that, that's from the student side. From the institutional side, there has been a lot of strides, specifically with the private education organizations. Uh, we work with uh, some large institutes like LPU and, and others where uh, we have integrated programs where uh, it's very industry immersive. We have hackathons with CTFs, right? Not hackathons, but CTFs. Uh, we have uh, industry workshops and so on. So that when the student is about to join the workforce, they are better trained, better certified, uh, better at, at whatever they want to do, uh, specifically in the cybersecurity side. The third aspect is the enterprise, where uh, what we tell is to have a more a better clarity on the job roles that are there. There are some job roles that are mostly hidden, uh, and there is a mismatch because the descriptions are not uh, extremely well written, or there is a disconnect between the uh, sponsor, which is the business team, versus the HR who actually goes and does the hiring. So uh, if, you, if you are able to bridge this triangle, students, institutions, uh, and the enterprise, I think uh, we will slowly, uh, you know, uh, close that gap. So uh, once they are in, uh, you know, they are in a much more better position and the organization also does not need to spend a lot of money on the incubation side. So that's my take on how we are doing things in, uh, in India right now. Great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, very important to, um, have that ecosystem, right? I mean, if you look at the gap, I mean, it's basically the difference between demand and supply, right? Um, Ma'am, you had mentioned that uh, the gap has been growing yeah. tremendously uh, in India. And that's also because of the rate of digitalization that's been, you know, that's been happening uh, like in India. So one immediate way would be using more of automated tools to, to you know, to look at uh, certain levels. Uh, that's when you're looking at... Uh, actually trying to secure uh, the organization infrastructure. To, uh, like to what Pradipto had also mentioned, and that is um, actually having a pathway. You know, um, how do individuals know, you know, what next? Where do you start with? I mean, you don't get away with just, that's just breaking things. I mean, it's, uh, like it's probably easier to break than to mend. Um, so, you know, how do you actually build and accumulate those skills? Then the other thing is also trying to ensure that you are relevant, say, in three years, in five years. The rate at which technology uh, tools are being used within uh, the cybersecurity ecosystem, the value that you bring to the organization needs to be maintained. And so that is keeping that future development uh, in place. So having uh, like a pathway uh, providing guidance will enable individuals to determine, you know, how, if they have the right skill sets, if they have the right mentality. I mean, that again is very, very important because what you learned yesterday is not going to <laughs> help you uh, as much as it did, you know, say, say like three years down the line. So there has to be that continuous learning. The other is, you know, what you were talking about, and that is educating employers. Um, I, I see job ads entry level, and you want CISSP. Hello, CISSP, you, you need at least around eight to nine years work experience before you can, you know. So that mismatch and the expectation. So looking at the job tasks, mapping it to uh, the skill requirements, 
to effectively actually perform those tasks and then having a mechanism to measure the like the competency mm -hmm. of the individual to perform those skills um, so i think you know and and this is not only a, uh, this is not only a challenge that's faced in india it is uh, yeah it's a general a, a, one. like it is a general one and there are um, you know there are different initiatives uh, trying to provide that visibility we should also not forget that the cybersecurity profession is a relatively newer profession compared to the others right i mean so uh, we've done a good job everyone has done a good job but there's still a long way uh, to go so i think having the pathway is very very important can i just interrupt yeah, yeah. one one yeah. quick point uh, the other thing that i have realized is um, is a buzzword driven aspiration that um, blockchain every student will oh we need to do blockchain we need to be a blockchain engineer uh, i think whenever we get a chance to talk to students and the, that ecosystem i think we need to make them more aware about that look figure out what is the job and what skills you require i'm sorry that's fine i think one important thing which is there is curriculum sticking to basics that's very important like i can be a good cyber security engineer if i am like Uh, my domain is infrastructure if i know the things technologies will come and go that's not the point that today we know how technologies are changing every second day we have a new tool which is in the market and uh, you know there's a buzz about it and uh, whether people understand that or not like nowadays even a simple script is also said that we are using ai and it's being sold so what is important is one stick to basics second is the curriculum like the fellow panelist said cyber security as a word everybody thinks it's one smaller thing uh, do some hacking or something like that but the term in itself is so vast that there can be you know a number of towers which can be built up and the specialization mm -hmm. on that that specialization see the scarcity of resources is where specialization is required the generalist can be anyone so the specialization piece will only come when we have the curriculum designed in that a way that i am doing something which is specific to that particular thing i think that's a very important point which we need to see with respect to a generation which wants to come into cyber security but it's not only about the skills which are there i think every person who is there sitting in this room at our home needs to have that awareness about cyber security and have a basic skill of that that's where i think certain things which were have been previously done by government are really uh, you know they they should be highly appreciated for example the cyber swatch one program which was run or mm -hmm. the cyber awareness programs which are run or for that matter the different sectors if you see uh, last three months i am seeing some basic ads which are coming on newspapers mm -hmm. just a lady showing stop you know that that's a very catchy thing than having a whole detailed one it really catches fast and the person who is reading it can understand it i think there is where our focus should be more and then if our basics are right we will learn the technology because technology by the time if i am an if i am doing an engineering course for four years i know when i got into engineering in the first year the technology which was there would have changed and with the new gbts of world it's going to change like anything we don't know what new gbt is today it is one gpt tomorrow it can be something else we don't know what what there would be after four years but today with the rush of students to ai and ml the other disciplines are feeling a crunch and cyber security is also one of them you you have a shortage and you have an additional shortage so there are two sides to this one is how do we get students enrolled into cyber security courses the second is how could ai and ml people contribute to cyber security both sides could be looked at yeah himanshu your comments uh, please so two aspects uh, clayton you mentioned about pathway i actually want to bring something interesting uh, and this is our side of the table not this is you know the uh, uh, the uh, study institutions that side of table uh, you always want somebody with a five years of experience but with 10 certifications right you uh, uh, okay you've heard of ai you have heard of blockchain add that in the job description okay do we do we really understand what is the use case out of it 
how it, how is it going to benefit the organization or the business processes that's uh, that's again i would go back to digital divide mm -hmm. sorry i'm saying this because mm -hmm. uh, this is a reality so okay. but the things are changing priyamada uh, the things are changing uh, people uh, like in the previous session uh, divya mentioned about uh, inculcating the skills starting from the childhood mm. so you live in hong kong right in in hong kong and singapore <laughs> even children in kindergarten they are taught about the physical safety and security how to stay uh, uh, you know safe during fires and floods and you know earthquakes if those kind of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, those kind of skills are inculcated into school children so at least the pathway can be created every every child uh, is different i mean going back to priyamada what we spoke about uh, the psychology part part of it mm -hmm. definitely there would be somebody who uh, is more inclined towards cyber security and like you said amir cyber security is not just hacking we only show okay somebody uh, with uh, uh, with you know with thorns or with bad intent or you know some interesting picture okay this is a hacker but hackers don't look like that always right mm -hmm. so uh, that glamorization part of hacking uh, uh, translated into cyber security field is very minuscule part of it so there is, there is a lot of uh, uh, you know gap which needs to be filled there's organizations are working towards it for example uh, i have a three team member i mean who would imagine a manufacturing industry has a uh, you know three team three team members in cyber security but we have that because the uh, the way that we were able to convince the management it can be done mm -hmm. so 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 yeah that divide uh, writing the job descriptions knowing what needs to be done is something uh, that we okay. need to work so on so adding to this um, entire discussion in our organization when we really looked at these job descriptions and job roles we came up with 32 distinct roles each requiring their own specialization so the field is really vast and there is a possibility for entry level people to get in and but there are roles which only seniors could address so there's there's a big um, <clears throat> you would say a range uh, in that which could be used both by the industry and by the universities but what happens is if universities have to create courses they don't really see job descriptions for entry level people that's uh, another issue and something that we also discussed was reducing this digital divide would help us because when parents become aware that there is extreme like cyber security in which they, the children could make a career, <laughs> you would also see them. It's, it's rarely that children go into an education field, at least in the context we know, without the family's backing. So that could also be an area where building the digital divide would help uh, get us more people into to this field. Okay, so we go to the next very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> So we have our digital public infrastructure now set up. What could additionally go into this digital public infrastructure? We have Aadhaar authentication. So that's identity and identity is confirmed. Access management comes next, but it's a part of it. So what could be the additional elementary building blocks that come into this public infrastructure itself that could enable cyber security as a public good? So I think to start with the, uh, at least the basic thing, mm -hmm. what we can do is the privacy impact assessment. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important mm -hmm. for anything which is going into cloud before it goes in production. The impact assessment with respect to privacy is very important. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That means that, okay, I, I know most of the organizations would today have an, uh, identity and access module which defines authorization which defines uh, you know our bank and other things uh, but the data which i am putting into this cloud mm -hmm. what is that data exactly how impactful that data is per se with respect to the organization whether it's personal data it's health data it's credit card data we know for credit cards now pci is something which is mandated so that's in but what about the other data for example in india uh, it's very easy for everyone to say, okay, what's up me your Aadhaar card? I'll get it done. Or for example, you know, <coughs> getting the details for the marketing. I, uh, even if I go to a website, scroll something, next day I would uh, get 10 calls for it. Yeah. You know, are you interested for a loan or something like that? So my data at any point of time as an individual or as an organization 
is risk because there are third parties which mm-hmm. are involved mm-hmm. it's not only about my organization it's about my extended organization also which supports me over there so that's why i feel that uh, privacy impact assessment is one of the major things which is Could very important could be offered important. as a service from this uh, as yeah. a service or how it can be done is yes, sir. You know, yeah how is a different discussion yeah, so how, but we would need yeah. something like that that's okay. that's that's very important mm-hmm. but primarily it's very important i see organizations building up their dpos who have ample knowledge of it because it's a combination of legal and cyber and it and everything so again i feel it's a journey which we are moving on yeah manchu uh, so the uh, you know few of the foundational aspects of this digital public infrastructure the digital identity aadhar uh the uh, uh digital payment system the upis and the you know other uh, payment systems uh, the digitally secured data or digital lockers i think uh, there is already work going on on digital currency yeah. so so these four five pillars are already getting established i think the piece missing is the collaboration okay the government is working on the laws the uh, uh, the frameworks the Uh, uh the intent should be on the uh, 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 uh you know full implementation mm-hmm. right adoption of those frameworks mm-hmm. we have the dpdp law right all the it's a law now right it's almost a year now i know a lot of organizations are working toward it but if you really ask the management at that level it's still a question mark okay what do we really need to do about it mm-hmm. there is still work going on mm-hmm. when the gdpr came a couple of years back there was a lot of buzz about uh, you know getting compliant to gdpr but uh, 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 but still if you ask a lot of security professionals uh, the full understanding about it is still missing that's the reality so that collaboration between what what is expected what is the intent at the national level at the dpi level or something that we want to achieve as an as a, as a country but uh, versus what is happening on ground is that uh, again we'll go back to that digital divide is something that we need to uh, fill and that is where platforms like this uh, is something which mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know these these conversations needs to happen more mm-hmm. uh i think that is something which we can build i think that collaboration uh between organizations between uh, uh, you know various enterprises thought process you come and meet and share ideas and try and build mm-hmm. uh and another aspect you called out privacy i think there are concepts like privacy by design and secure by design that also needs to come into picture mm-hmm. so before we before we really talk about start talking about uh, uh the uh, the the fully executable a uh, dpi or okay. the public infrastructure yeah yes. just that one thing that the regulator does not send ciso behind the bars that's a very important one <laughs> so i think it's uh, leading to actually uh, leading to governance right um ensuring that there's compliance ensuring that there are certain rules procedures in place um both uh, to like to protect the identity or the privacy of uh, like of the individual um i i i mean i uh, also see that cert in have also introduced the impaneled auditors mm-hmm. program and i think that is one step the first step to uh look at you know to actually assess uh the uh the health mm-hmm. <laughs> the like the infrastructure or the organizational mm-hmm. infrastructure i mean there is uh, it's uh one step at a time and obviously there is um a long way to go mm-hmm. uh and it's it it would require the it would require the participation across different sectors uh improving or elevating the overall cyber hygiene of the sub individuals um ensuring that there's proper direction or uh, guidance towards building capacity uh and then also making sure that you know there are rules regulations and guidance in place uh maybe f- say like for critical national infrastructure it's more stringent compared mm. uh like to others and then ensuring that it's it's actually followed it's enforced um and then you know maybe there has to be say an agency that is uh, that oversees or is responsible that takes ownership for the development implementation and enforcement um of this governance structure 
Um, I'll build upon what uh, all of you said, but uh, one concept that I have is data as a commodity. Uh, there are two sides of the coin. Uh, one side is uh, I'm happy when I'm going on Netflix and uh, it's posting me stuff which is my preference, right? So that's the one side of the coin. The second side of the coin is that uh, XYZ calling me up and trying to sell uh, uh, something you know which can be innocuous uh, so i think that the dpdp um, act will be a game changer in this uh, direction where at least there will be some structure to how we, we use uh, data and the responsibility and the onus on the data fiduciaries with like what amir mentioned of the dpos uh, and the penalties that are imposed on the uh, data fiduciaries i think that will make a huge difference um, however, uh, you know, uh, we were discussing again uh, in the backstage that uh, one part is developing an act and the second part is developing standards that can be linked to that act. For example, uh, in the US you have the FISMA, FISMA, and the NIST, the National Institute of Stand Standards, and Technolo Standards in Technologies, uh, and within the act, they borrow uh, these standards that are mentioned in the NIST. So that's one way. So can DSCI or organizations or the government uh, take up aspirationally towards going towards that direction? That's one piece. Second is also identifying risk management becomes a very big part of it. So are we able to build the KRIs, the key risk indicators? Um, I think as of now, even health is not in the critical infrastructure, which I feel should be a part of uh, health information. We, t we talked about a lot about HIPAA in the US, where uh, uh, the health in information is, uh, is available. I think COVID taught us that uh, having a repository of a secure uh, health information should be there. It is still not there, I guess, in the CII. Uh, but that can be one of the directions that, uh, you know, we, we can all collectively, the government, associations, and the enterprises organization can move towards in one direction. Yeah, and um, looking at the topic of the conference, decade, uh, quantum safe cryptography is one, one of the areas that is called out in this conference. So you could also have on this digital public infrastructure building blocks of such uh, types where you bring quantum safe cryptography to the people who would like to use it. End-to-end -end encryption, how could you enable that? Zero knowledge proofs, how could you enable that? Can we have standardization in this direction and can we offer these as elementary building blocks that the organizations could readily use to set up cyber security solutions? So this could be the technological part of this digital uh, public infrastructure and it could be used for that. So good, I think um, after that uh, bit, then we finally come back to summarize, yes, how should governance for privacy and cybersecurity look like and what should be the essential components of such, yeah, a governance framework. Yes. <laughs> Again, uh, you know, like I said, this is altogether a journey with the new law which is in place. Thankfully, it's not so stringent <coughs> like GDPR and uh, people won't go uh, behind bars. I think there should be something which is a common protocol, at least for all public private organizations to mm -hmm. follow off. We understand that sometimes regulator ga you know, gets very stringent of with the technology we are working on, uh, you know, like the remote accesses and other things, the regulator gets very stringent on. But the time has come when uh, we need to be more secure than what we were earlier with the different type of new technologies which are coming and one of AI and ML is the main contributor for that. So regulation is one very important thing which will help in the governance. The second part is the uh, involvement from the board or the management. I think this is one thing which is very important, wherein your management, your top level management, not the second level management, your top level management is part of it and is 
has a mandate of cyber citizen charter so that means that every citizen who's with the organization or is outside is responsible for his part of cyber not that the ciso who has a seat you know with thorns is only responsible for it every individual who is working in an organization whether he's from sales marketing it non it or standing behind a counter and using a pos is responsible for that i think these things will help us to build a more uh, you know governance structure and like i spoke about the assessments that is something very important first i should know what what are my gaps what i need to do that gaps and other things i can only know if i have done if i have visibility to my whole of an infrastructure and have a consolidated view of things and then uh, you i know where i am lacking and i can get that fixed out uh i'll uh, i'll stick to collaboration okay uh, at the organization level amir you mentioned about the board a typical answer my bosses would say okay we only got 5 minutes what do you expect mm. okay it's not only that 5 minutes i think you need to create that awareness don't wait for october right it's a monthly effort it's a weekly effort uh, spread out the collaboration sales marketing various departments and when you go out of the enterprise spread out that collaboration at various levels uh, so in the manufacturing industry uh, when you enter a factory area you are given a safety hat safety boot and safety jackets so that in case anything happens you are safe and you are easily recognized okay are you an employee are you uh, you know visitor or were you somebody who was supposed to enter this area now this is a ritual which is followed why because it was enforced for so many years can this happen with cyber security can we do this with uh, with with people's minds that okay if a message comes with a lady saying hi or with a cashback offer not always supposed to click it right click on the link never and click on it yeah. right those kind of things so collaboration uh, <clears throat> i would want to share a little lighter on a lighter note uh, it's like uh, uh, uh ceo ceo sometimes asks okay where is my file so the answer ceo says okay it ran somewhere okay it ran somewhere <laughs> you um i think one important off. point which i want to add over here with collaboration is like not collaboration within the organization outside the organization and outside the country also mm -hmm. like for example sir.in is uh, the a lot of things which are coming in but that collaboration is only you know based that now india has a cert but see overall this cert talks to different certs who, who are globally over there and that gives a very huge you know input to us as an organization because we are like aware that what is going on in at different parts and we keep a track on that and we can fix that out that's very important that collaboration not with internal only internal stakeholders the external stakeholders and the external world also yeah you're closing remarks right. um, on governance yes i would say harmonization of standards also mm -hmm. you had mentioned about uh, collaboration both within and outside um so yeah when you're looking at governance and requirements compliance requirements um, uh, then harmonization of standards across will actually make it also easier for industry to adopt large multinationals that operate with like in different economies have to comply to to the to the requirements in those mm -hmm. economies and if there is huge variance from economy to economy then you know it becomes a challenge um when you talk about governance you know um i think first and foremost how it will shape up um is uh two things one is that the divide between the governance world and the tech world uh the tech world drives the business because you have innovation there the governance is more of uh, okay we need to do that do that so let's do that uh, that divide needs to be uh, because the hacker is not looking at your governance or anything they are looking at the vulnerability at your web browser right yeah. so uh, however uh, you know authorization or classification or aup you put in um, 
they're going to steal information or uh, you know do whatever. Uh, the second piece is that uh, can we have an automated uh, DevSec or process from a regulation standpoint in the US they have done the uh, CATO which is the uh, uh, continuous uh, authorization of all software products and components that puts together. So yeah, those are the two points. I think that is how it will shape up. And obviously that leads to different set of competence and different set of job roles. So we need to be mindful about those changes that are happening when we communicate with the uh, student ecosystem. Okay, so <clears throat> I would add my own points to it, but summing it up, um, we need to start really with literacy, cybersecurity at a larger scale then look at creating pathways for competence building, looking at the kind of the competent, complex picture that we have for cyber security skills that we would need and also would need in the future, that's the second part, should be a part of this governance framework. Third, the public infrastructure uh, that's available and what can it make available to the people. Fourth, regulations like U Europe is looking at, the Cyber Resilience Act can DPDP we already have, but can we have something like that? And like how Singapore is doing with the labeling of the uh, products, can products convey information to the consumers uh, saying how safe, how safe and how secure they are? So this would be also part of that infrastructure. So finally, but um, the standardization, filling the gaps and harmony. And not to be missed, collaboration. Okay, so um. uh, I'll just add one last. Uh, I was reading a. I'm sorry for this. Yeah, just one minute. Uh, there's a very interesting white paper by Deloitte. It's called uh, Future of Cybersecurity 2035, where they have done a apocalyptic futuristic viewpoint, where it's uh, Mad Max, there is a Star Trek world, there is a, a White Queen, and the and the fourth one I guess was. Um, uh, something else, another some movie thing where they have given scenarios. So I think we will be in the Star Trek being optimistic, you know, it's kind of collaboration among all stakeholders. Uh, so I think that is what we should aspire for. Okay, are there questions to the panel? <clears throat> it's questions time. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I am for yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Mm. So I have one question. Uh, when you're saying that there should be a, uh, there should be a security awareness at the uh, initial levels itself. So when we are talking about a CISSP, now CISSP is given is expected to a person who has at least five years experience in cybersecurity. So do you have programs or do you have some uh, uh, method? Do you, do you have some slide decks which can be maybe uh, taught to students in the schools. Do you have that kind of programs in your uh, IC squared or Comtia, yeah, okay. where maybe you are encouraging the IC the certificate holders, to maybe as a CPE right. thing, they can go to the schools yeah. and educate the kids. So at the risk of selling, yeah. <clears throat> um, I lead uh, for IC two. Um, the 1 million CC program. So it is actually uh, a program that we launched last year, offering 1 million free uh, online training uh, and also examination, uh, so uh, to entry level. And it's actually used by, uh, like by different agencies and governments, you know, which we engage with uh, to elevate or to raise the cyber hygiene. So that is one uh, that's that's one initiative you know that we have, but also through the foundation, we have initiatives uh, looking at trying to educate uh, the uh, <coughs> like I'd say senior citizens, senior citizens, uh, I'd say kids. And when we look at uh, so when you're also looking at say say like kids, it's you know we sometimes talk only about say the financial harm. But you know, that is actually a very small portion of what that age group is actually targeted for. Um, so we have, uh, we've, we've got some of those programs where we have our members, I mean, we are now close to half a million, um, it's like across the world, 
to go to schools, to go to uh, different communities, uh, let's speak. But I'm sure even Comte has. Uh, so we operate a little on a, uh, you know, uh, when you're talking about ISC2, the most visible is CISSP. We work a little lesser on the more practitioner side. But what we are doing right now is uh, we've just launched a digital literacy program, which has got a lot of uh, components of uh, uh, basic cyber security. Um, that's the monetized product that we are developing in terms of training and, and assessment um, at a very affordable price. Uh, but apart from that, uh, from a resources standpoint also, Comptia has got a lot of very small bite size uh, videos, etc. how to set a password, what is a phishing, what is an anatomy of a phishing attack and so on, uh, which we have. So we are working on that direction definitely. There was a question, yes. Good morning, gentlemen. I am Colonel Sunil Kaka, retired. Uh, sir, we talked about the lack of digital literacy, the need of social engineering, spreading the awareness, that bridging the triangle and kinds of things. And the pace at which the digitization in India is going ahead, naturally the cybersecurity education is not at that level and it's not spreading that fast. What role of the industry that you feel they should contribute as a corporate social responsibility towards spreading this awareness and bridging such kinds of gaps? Because the rural India they won't be able to take on these kinds of programs uh, that you are talking about. So how to make them aware? Because the biggest of the vulnerabilities, they come from these places. So what role of the industry that you see into that? Sir? Uh, I think, Colonel, uh, uh, at Dalmia, we have Dalmia Vidya Mandir, which is the educational institution. Uh, it's, a, it's a chain of schools, which is run by the trust. And uh, there are more than 6,000 school children not only outsiders, but uh, the, the, the employees who are working at the plant locations, for their benefit, it was started. And it was started way back in 1940s, 1947, after you know, the independence. Uh, there, uh, you know, post the COVID, uh, we started a, a, a quarterly program for all the school teachers, uh, especially at that point in time when the, uh, the classes were supposed to happen on WhatsApps and you know, Zoom calls. Uh, and most of the school teachers, parents, they did not know how to operate. And that's the sad reality. Uh, so that point in time, we started running basic campaigns. And this actually answers to your question. I mean, uh, Cyber Swachata, which you called out, there are small nuggets available. The government has taken that initiative. Small nuggets available, the do's and don'ts, how to stay safe. With that uh, building up, we are going to the level of uh, uh, you know, conducting certain specialized classes for uh, ninth and above. Uh, uh, for that particular age. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember, many years back, I think almost a decade back, uh, there was a there was a, a game which was uh, patronized amongst the school children, Blue Whale. I'm sorry I'm bringing that up, but that is something which you, ne which you need to talk about. Uh, where where uh, the school children, young children and young uh, adults, they were targeted uh, in, a, in a very negative manner. <coughs> If you, if you start talking about these things, you're actually talking about, you know, something which is at the emotional level and then start uh, teaching kids uh, how to stay safe online. Uh, I think that is what uh, the, as part of these corporate social responsibility you called out. There are so many uh, organizations which, which are working towards it. Uh, we are also working towards it. Uh, I'm sure Nestle also uh, is doing that. Uh, but yes, you're right, that at the grassroots level, uh, 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 there is definitely a digital divide and that's where the collaboration works. Uh, if you teach uh, parents, uh, if you teach children, you're not only teaching them, you're teaching parents, you're teaching grandparents. Uh, the grandparents, uh, you're teaching uncles, aunties and buas and everybody. Uh, I think that's the chain that you need to. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, clearly CSR could come in and support this. but. Um, Rather than very small individual efforts, which we anyway put in, can we design a large scale campaign like the Pulse Polio campaign in which everybody could join? You know, uh, most of the issues are not, uh, you know, you do not have an attacker who has gotten into the system. They're all how to exploit emotional aspects in us. I love you. You know, you open the mail. That's it. So that's 
how do I really make a judgment before I click? Is the question. Yeah, I think uh, a, a very well designed co component that keeps the emotion in mind and takes the technology into the human angle and the technology angle together. I think into that mainstream, all of us and also could join to bridge this. Thing. Do it. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, once again, thank you for all the panelists on the dais. So there is a small gratitude from our side. So requesting Mr. Rahul to hand over the momento.